project perception. There's a difference between a project and an investment. For the investment, you do a business case analysis. You apply a different method, which helps you for decision making. But for projects, you have your project uh, objectives and your uh, project plans. And this is to be differentiated from the investment. And all of these terms are not clearly differentiated and not dealt appropriately with this. And therefore, uh, many companies don't get the benefits out of uh, project management. Hi, this is your Project Management Cowboy coming back to you with another podcast. Our topic today is project management, the past, the present, the future. In Austria, there's if you were to ask who best represents project management on these three topics, there's only one person that comes to mind. Um, I have a special honor today uh, to have a guest here with us. Um, he has a long, long title. Uh, I just call him Roland. Okay, That's good. Uh, Professor Roland Gagais, an absolute icon in project management, not only in Austria, um, but over the borders of Austria as well. Uh, Roland, welcome. It's very friendly introduction. Thanks yes, a lot. Yes, it comes, it comes from the heart. Yeah, it comes from I the heart. I accept it. Um, one of the, the standard questions I always ask so that, that our, our listeners can kind of zone in is like, why are these two guys talking? How do we know each other? Well, it's a long story, I guess. Um, when project management really got started uh, in Austria, I was involved with IPMA, mm -hmm. the International Project Management Association, with the local representation, which was Project Management Austria. I was the uh, CEO uh, in these days. You were the founding father as well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, kind of. Um, and you've been active with PMI, which mm -hmm. did get started in these days in mm -hmm. Austria, PMI Austria. So in the early days, we've been competitors. Yeah. Uh, and I remember some uh, meetings which were not so friendly because... Oh, I thought they were great. I, I loved our first <laughs> meeting. A lot of people would say it was, it was uh, very uh, rude. I didn't think it was rude. I thought it was very direct and very honest. I, I appreciated our conversation. I'm more sensitive than you are. So <laughs> <laughs> this is why we see this situation so differently. But we became friends over the years. And uh, what I really loved was that we played tennis yeah. uh, a few times mm -hmm. in uh, the Wiener Park Club and so on. So. Yeah, I guess we have something in common, which mm -hmm. is uh, this uh, interest in projects and project management and that we both contributed quite a bit mm. to the development of this field. Actually, the first time I reached out to you to have an appointment uh, with you, I was just founding the PMI chapter mm -hmm. and, and I went to you to, to get your feedback and to kind of say, hey, listen, you know, we're creating something new, but we don't want to be competitors. We kind of want to cooperate. Uh, and, and I think it's a good analogy for what we're going to be talking about today. Back then, that's over 20 years ago, I was the, the new kid on the block, kind of green behind the ears, as we say in German. Um, and you were the, 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 the senior project management. You're a, a couple of years older than I am. Um, and I, I learned a lot from, from, from the way, from the things that you did on the market. And that's kind of what we're talking about today. Is what we know from the past still relevant for, for, for the future? Um, I, I know we've, we've talked about this bef before when we were setting up for this, for this uh, podcast. You said, what's the kind of the framework? And I was going through the framework. Mm -hmm. with, and you were a little bit hesitant to go uh, into your long CV because you have a very long CV. But I, want, I think the, the listeners deserve to know a little bit about, uh, uh, about you. You've, they've already mm -hmm. found out that you're the founder <laughs> of, of PMA, which is the mm -hmm. IPMA subsidiary of Austria. Austria. Uh, but you have a, a really a, a glorious, wonderful past in project management. And I think that that should be interesting. I think that doesn't just uh, underline your legitimacy uh, talking about about the, the, mm -hmm. this topic, uh, but also makes you an interesting character. I like to call it the passion journey. If you were to give the listener kind of a, uh, a synopsis of, of where you started off, what your background is, what would you mm -hmm. tell them? Well, I hope you'll have a little time. <laughs> so um, now what I think might be of interest for the listeners is the relationship between uh, my professional development and uh, the understanding of what a project and what project management is. Because in the early days, um, you see, uh, after my studies uh, at the University of Business Administration in Austria, uh, in Vienna actually, um, I joined the Technical University. 
uh, a construction management department there. And this was back in 1973, 74. And what I learned there was uh, Netzplan Technik. Yeah. So network, network diagrams. Network diagrams. Which uh, I still CPM, love and a lot of people don't use. CPM yeah. uh, diagrams and so on. This was uh, the understanding of what's required in um, construction and what project management basically is all about. So it was one of the operational research approaches, methods. Uh, there was Warteschlangen theory and others. Um, so very quantitative approaches uh, to projects and to project management. And very predictive is, is the word that, w that PMI likes to use. Yeah, yeah. correct, correct. Uh, for predictive yeah. projects, uh, uh, but by definition, projects are socially complex, so nothing is predictive really. And so I guess in these early days, uh, that was the understanding of what a project and what project management is. And this is how I was brought up uh, with this topic. And um, later on, I moved to Georgia and I worked at uh, the Georgia Tech, uh, Georgia Institute of Technology yeah. in Atlanta and uh, also in a construction management department. So project, project management was applied in construction, in engineering, in R&D. So in more technical and the, uh, and the technical approaches. nature of it made the, the approach also kind of technical. That's correct. Quantitative, right. visual, yeah. reliable, that yeah. kind of stuff. Yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, what happened to me then was that uh, in Austria, the engineering uh, industry had um, in the export uh, business had some problems uh, and the University of Business Administration, the Technical University decided for the first time to develop an inter-universitarian program, uh, which oh, was wow. called project management in the export industry. Mm -hmm. And they wanted me to be the director of this uh, program. Uh, and I was not on the staff of uh, the universities, but I did this as an external uh, consultant. I developed this program and uh, for the first time, actually, we were talking about project management, not construction management. Uh, but still with this flavor um, of yeah, the technical orientation and so on. And only later on, um, when I became um, the board member of uh, Project Management Austria, we applied in IPMA to organize the IPMA World Congress in Vienna. When was that? That was in, in 1990. Yeah. And we had two years of preparation for that. And we were doing some brainstorming what could be the title of this uh, Congress and, you know, we were working on a flip chart and there was project and management and so on. And all of a sudden we switched uh, the order of the terms around and made project management to management by projects. So all of a sudden a new management paradigm actually to the approach that we say you can manage organizations by projects. Uh, and that meant that we're not only talking about technical projects anymore, but uh, reorganization projects, marketing projects, and those required a different approach to management. So you are not working with CPM schedules uh, there, but uh, they were more open, more dynamic, more mm. agile, I would say, uh, in the terminology. Also more today. integrated with the with the strategic vision and mission of, of, of the executives. Yeah, Correct, because mm -hmm. basically you are not doing contracting work for some other clients, but you are changing your own organizations mm -hmm. by developing new products, uh, applying new marketing approaches, uh, reorganizing and so on. So yes, it became more strategic. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden also project portfolio management became a topic because you didn't look at a few contracts that you were performing, but at your total portfolio. Uh, and all of a sudden people said, well, they're not only projects, but they are larger things than projects, all of a sudden program management came in. So based on this new vision that you can manage organizations by projects, uh, the whole field further developed. And that was really a milestone in my opinion and contributed to uh, perceiving projects differently and also approaching project management differently. In my opinion, what happened in the industry was that there's still today a very old-fashioned uh, approach to project management, still looking at it from this very quantitative and technical uh, viewpoint. And that means that uh, you don't use the strength of project management really appropriately. Mm. If you 
don't use a more comprehensive, mm. more complex uh, view on what projects actually are and how you have to mm. manage and handle them. Mm. Uh, you were a university professor and, and, and yeah. basically the academic uh, vanguard of project management. So you had an interesting function. You were, you have a, your own consulting company, Golden mm -hmm. Gars Consulting, which has Correct. been around for a long, long time. One of the first uh, consulting companies mm -hmm. focused on project management Correct. and not on broad uh, management subjects. Then you had one leg in, in academia, very, very strong, very active. Um, many, many years at the university, and then you were also the the, the president and, and founder of, of PMA in Austria. Yeah, I mean, PMA actually started the whole thing, and in parallel, I also did my consulting work uh, starting in 1983, uh, and only in 1994, I became professor at the University of Business Administration in Vienna, which is interesting. It's not on a technical university, but at a business University and there aren't too many business universities still mm. that have uh, professorships uh, in project management. But given that uh, I was active with uh, PMA, uh, the university became aware, uh, and I was teaching there already, but not uh, with a, a formal uh, professorship. Um, and so, in 1994 only, I started uh, to work uh, in this position, and this was very. Um, helpful because on the one hand uh, there was the possibility given that research was of course a topic uh, to further develop with a group of students uh, the uh, field of project management and on the other hand to transfer some of my experiences from consultancy uh, to the students so this was very synergetic so mm -hmm. uh, I really uh, appreciated uh, these possibilities and uh, overall I have to say I was very fortunate actually to get involved in this field because as we see and we'll talk about it a little later on, uh, it's still further developing, right? Uh, and this is, as I say, fortunate because very often you are stuck in some field which is not yeah. really uh, moving. You mentioned that, that your one of your first exposures to, to project management was over the TU, the Technical University mm -hmm. in, in, in Austria. In the in the area of construction now, that, for anybody who who understands anything about project management, they'll know that that construction is the oldest mm -hmm. um, discipline mm -hmm. or uh, field of, of industry that has been dedicated to project management. Uh, um, if you look at our archaeology, all of our our great buildings were mm -hmm. were built through projects. Uh, I think it 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 provides you a a strong foundation to understand project management. Um, what was the, the experience transitioning from a from a more old fashion, I might say, construction project management paradigm to a more broader business? You kind of mentioned it that that part of it uh, came uh, came through this symposium that you had in the nineties. Um, what was the paradigm shift from construction to to broader project management? Uh, what can you share with us? What that's concerned. Rephrase uh, the okay. question. I uh, the uh, let's let's put it this way. If you look at uh, look at project management, uh, most project managers nowadays are focused on. Uh, most people would say, "Ah, it's IT," which is hogwash. Okay, a lot of people say uh, when we're talking about project management, we only have to talk about DevOps. We only have to talk about Agile because everything is that way. And I think mm -hmm. it's it's that's BS. The largest projects and the majority of projects today are still not IT projects. Mm -hmm. Their organizational development project, their product development project, and their construction project. Construction projects, there's there's very few IT projects that can compete with the complexity of a large building of a dam hmm. or building of uh, Burj Al Arab or, or whatever it might be. Um, so when you start off in project management, you had this construction focus. So you kind of learned you learned it by the by the by the rules, right? You, you, it's kind of the DNA of project. You, the, what you kind mm -hmm. of mentioned this quantitative approach. Um, what was the what 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 kind of what led you to the to the understanding? This doesn't just apply to construction. This has a much broader management relevance. You kind of mentioned it, mm. um, where you said management by project. What was the what was the 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 the, the spark that that kind of lit that flame? Does that make more sense? Yeah, yeah, sure, sure, sure. Um, I mean. Basically, I think the major benefit of projects and project management is uh, to work objectives-oriented, uh, that uh, you have clear objectives, uh, what you want to do, how you want to do it, 
um, and so on. And the question is, to what does this benefit apply? Is it just for construction objects that you want to build? Or is it uh, to other topics uh, like uh, cultural work? If you uh, direct uh, a movie or an opera or whatever, uh, this qualifies definitely as a project. But still, today, these are very traditional industries. They don't use the terminology of projects. Or if they do, they have a very self-designed version of it. Correct. Yeah. So there are different roles. You wouldn't find a project manager or a project owner or whatsoever. Uh, they have a lot of structures uh, that they apply, but they wouldn't call them work breakdown structures or CPM skills or whatsoever. So these things qualify uh, definitely as projects, but they are not perceived as such and are not managed as such. But still, obviously, they are successful and this is uh, feasible uh, to do it in this way. So all I'm saying is there are so many uh, fields where you can apply projects and project management in order to get the benefits, in order to uh, deal with something which is of strategic relevance, has a high social complexity, and therefore also requires a certain complexity in the management approach mm. that you're using. Mm. So I guess um, this is a never-ending story. There are so many fields. I mean, when I was uh, active in PMA, we had uh, a program, an Austrian program, which was called project management for everybody. So we went to schools. That's what I'm, I'm, I'm trying to tickle out Project management yeah. in the schools. Yeah. Uh, uh, and uh, my kids were so embarrassed, but they were uh, studying at the um, gymnasium, uh, high school, uh, whatsoever, um, in Vienna. And uh, I addressed the, the director of the school and said, well, uh, I think the project management might be of relevance for your kids and for you as the staff uh, of uh, running uh, such a school because you have exchange programs with other schools, uh, you have open days of the school, mm. uh, you implement uh, IT uh, infrastructure in the schools. These are actually school-related uh, projects uh, and we applied project management for these things and these were very interesting experiences and we went so far that we also uh, applied project management in the family. Uh, one of my uh, managers of PMI in these days uh, organized his uh, wedding, of course, as a project. And why not, I would say, right? Um, and my mother, she had a knee operation and uh, mother's new knee was uh, organized as a project. And we had uh, menu tastings because she couldn't move in the kitchen and so on. And all of that was organized in the uh, framework of a project. And we worked with Babak, one of the large um, Austrian banks, and they organized these events. And we had hundreds of participants who were interested in, we had some 10, 15 cases of uh, project management in the family. So, you know, it's a way of thinking. Uh, it's this context orientation. It's this objectives orientation. These are the benefits you don't have what necessarily used to, be, to call yeah. them projects. But what used to be it's called a mindset, yeah. you know. What used to be called MBO management by objectives. Mm -hmm. Project management is actually the taking MBO to the next level. Say, okay, because I think this is what I always like to tell people when I talk to board mm -hmm. members, right? Mm -hmm. They always ask me, what do I need project management for? I said, Well, you guys are all great about when it comes to talking about visions and missions, mm -hmm. but that's not that's not even half the game. That's like one hundredth of the game. Uh, for your vision to come true, there are hundreds, if not thousands, of people in the background that have to go through complex processes and coordination and collaboration yeah. to create your vision. Uh, project management is the manifestation of a vision. Um, I, I like what you're saying because it kind of reminds me, I'm a big fan of Stephen Covey, um, the, the famous author of Seven Habits of Highly Successful People. And when he wrote his book, his original orientation was, was business. Mm -hmm. Um, but he also later came out with books for Seven Habits for, for Raising Children, Seven mm -hmm. Habits for, mm -hmm. for Family, uh, mm -hmm. because he realized that the skill set that you have in, in project management can, is, is universal. You can use it up to many different things. Um, 
Funny enough that you mentioned uh, that you offered also going to schools because I was recently contacted by somebody who took my seminar, a French lady, mm -hmm. who said I was so thrilled with your seminar. Uh, I, we'd love you. We'd love you to come to to our um, our high school and and mm -hmm. talk to the kids about mm -hmm. project management. So I I, I I can sympathize with that. Um, let me ask you a question. If you were to, if you were to go back 20, 30 years, um, what would you what would you say were the big challenges in project management back then? Well, some of these challenges are still there. Uh, I would say. Uh, <laughs> that's, the why, first, that's why I got you here. Yeah, <laughs> the first thing is. Uh, what is the project understanding? Uh, what do people perceive as a project? And basically, it's a construct. It's an organizational decision to define something, a project, which requires management attention. And you give it management attention by applying professional project management. Um, so organizations have to decide on what is relevant to be managed uh, by project management and so i guess this decision is crucial uh, to understand what is the project because very often you know a whole life cycle um, to give you one example uh, i'm working quite a bit in it and sap for example uh, sap has a um, a model which is called sap activate um, sap activate yeah yeah and um so that uh, covers basically the whole life cycle of a um, uh, sub solution. And, uh, but there's no clear understanding basically that this life cycle of a solution might be uh, sequenced by several projects. You know, there's a discover phase and there you have to uh, define the overall scope and that is strategically so important that this discover phase uh, of sub activate could be defined a project by itself and then you have prepare. So we are thinking in chains of projects and that is a very HL mindset behind it. Uh, but we had this some 20 years ago to say, okay, uh, when you are now a construction or an engineering company, uh, you have your contracting project, but there might be a bidding project before that. And that has a very different quality uh, and a much higher complexity than maybe the construction project. Uh, socially uh, itself. So uh, how do you define the boundaries? Uh, how do you set the project in a context? Do you perceive it in this context, which means there are other projects, there's this company vision, you have to contribute, you have to pay into uh, perceiving uh, this vision appropriately, uh, and so on. So um, I guess project perception, there's a difference between a project and an investment. For the investment, you do a business case analysis, you apply a different method, which helps you for decision making. But for projects, you have your project uh, objectives and your uh, project plans. And this is to be differentiated from the investment. And all of these terms are not clearly differentiated and not dealt appropriately with this. And therefore, uh, many companies don't get the benefits out of uh, project management. And one other case uh, or topic, uh, of course, is the whole project organizations. Projects very often understood with to be the same like a project team. But no, a project is a temporary organization. And you have a project team, you might have sub teams, you might have a steering committee, you have a project owner. And the whole project organization has to be uh, established, has to be further developed, has to be controlled. Um, and just this perception makes a big difference and um, this was you know some of the shortcomings still um, back in 20 years uh, ago and uh, still today uh, I just had another podcast where we were talking about project team work and so on and I explained there that actually a steering committee might be perceived as a, as a team within a project organization but nobody ever thought about explicitly development, developing a project steering committee in terms of speaking one language, having a common uh, interest in the common view, taking on the common uh, project responsibility and so on. So uh, there are still so many details actually uh, to be uh, optimized and 
Yeah, sometimes, um, to tell you the truth, I'm a little bit disappointed that many things <laughs> that we're didn't still, get yeah, any further. Yeah. yeah. Um, let, me, let me summarize, because I think you've said a couple brilliant things. Um, let me kind of call back to some of the things that you said. Number one, the delineation between what is a project and what is not a project mm -hmm. and what relevance that have and what the hell is a matrix organization and what does that mean? Uh, and is there a value? Do we even have to consider the concept of a project? Is it a valid concept? I remember my father w was, was an executive and when I used to tell him about my project stuff, he was mm -hmm. always really excited. But one day mm -hmm. he cut me off and said, listen, you know, time out. What's this BS you're talking about? You're, mm -hmm. you're pretending like project management is his own discipline and it's not just management. I said, it is its own discipline. Mm -hmm. I had to explain it to him. It was mm -hmm. the first time I actually realized that executives, I think they, 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 they use the word um, uh, projects off the cuff, kind mm -hmm. of uh, shooting yeah. from the hip, but they don't really understand that it requires, I always say it requires a different set of rules. Um, so that the, the delineation was one topic. Um, Let me add here. Um, Bateson um, said a difference uh, makes a difference, um, George Bateson. And uh, what that means is that if you define something, a project, uh, you need to be very careful with the terminology. So as you yeah. say, yeah, uh, managers use the term project uh, very inflationary. Yes. Um, but, uh, but do they know what it means? When you call something a project, you make a difference. Yeah. And the difference is that you apply professional project management. And the question is, do you want to make this difference? Or do these CEOs and COOs and so on not even want uh, this clarification, this transparency and so on? Uh, now you're getting to the deeper psychological issues, yeah, yeah, I think. Because uh, sometimes uh, they don't want these benefits that you would, I, I, you're get. We're going to get back to that because that's yeah. a hot topic. So the, the next thing you, you mentioned in, in, in your dialogue was the concept of if we give something a name, okay, do makes we have a difference? A, yes, it makes a difference. And we're going to use, use Václavek, the semantics and pragmatics mm -hmm. and, and of, of, of language is important. The question is, do we have a common language? When, when I say project and you say project, are we talking about the same thing? I think 30 years ago, there was a huge issue. Common process is one of the things you talked about. You said, hey, listen, if you're going to call something, for example, um, the underlying philosophy of a line organization, which most organizations in the core mm -hmm. still are, um, if something's essential, if there's a process that's essential to the organization, you give it a name and you give it a department and you give it a budget and you give it resources, for example, accounting. Okay. Some people say accounting is, in bo is boring, but it's essential to the organization. So we have an accounting. If you're going to call something a project, do we have project management? Do we have dedicated resources? I think 30, 30 years ago, that was a, that was a mind boggling concept to a lot of, of people. And I think 30 years ago, we kind of fought for the concept of understanding that modern organizations from, from a yesteryear perspective, would have to look more at what this hybrid version of, of a matrix organization that you you can have a strong line organization that has certain rules but for your dynamic uh, uh, initiatives you can use projects um, one of the things that you've always been hugely implemental uh, in also in understanding that there's a gap here is capability building right I think I think that's still an issue today I think if you look into the internet certifications of project management, mm -hmm. I think there's never been more certifications out there. Everybody's confused. Nobody knows what they're good for. Nobody knows where they come from. The, the training for the, for the tests are often mm. mind-numbing. And I often ask myself the question, is there actually an education taking place or am I just memorizing things that, <laughs> so I can pass the exam? Um, you, you, didn't, you didn't mention the word, but I would love to entertain it maybe a little bit later on, is the concept of... Uh, you mentioned uh, uh, the steering committee, absolutely important. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm always shocked. Um, I think one of my, my biggest consulting initiatives when I go to, to companies is I often coach sponsors and steering committees because they're all willing and ready. Mm -hmm. But I'm always, I always ask some subtle questions. I think a lot of them are not really aware of what their active role is. They know mm -hmm. what their passive role is, but not what their active role is in project management. Passive, you mean to be informed? Active is to take on responsibility and make decisions. Well, exactly. Yeah. Passive, I mean, I think most of them understand that they yeah. have power, yeah. okay? But the question is active, are they actively seeking out information? Are they, are they, are they steering Correct. 
Are, yeah. are they just sitting back and waiting for you to, uh, as we say in German, berieselt werden? I just want to, yeah. I just want the information to kind of drip down on me. But I, you know, I want to take a shower, but I don't want to get wet type uh, mentality. So, so that's it. And and the other hot topic is PMOs because PMO is is quasi. You talked about there's things that are bigger than projects that have a longer uh, uh, um, a life cycle, programs. You also mentioned SAP, who is also an organization that I work with. We're actually doing a podcast with them later on this year because right. uh, I love their SAP. Act One of the greatest things I like about their SAP Activate thing is this: what you mentioned, this discovery and evaluation phase, mm -hmm. where they said it's it's there's something that happens before a project that's relevant to a project, the business case, mm -hmm. right? Um, and you also mentioned uh, something we had a, a, a gentleman on uh, before, Oliver Lehmann uh, from Munich, who has this concept of um, uh, project business management that mm -hmm. says, listen, let's stop pretending that all projects are the same. Uh, there's internal projects and there's external projects and there's a correlation and there's a lot of overlap. But if you have a business case, as you mentioned, it makes a difference. Mm -hmm. It's different in, in, in comparison to creating a product uh, or, or delivering something to your client. And that also requires a certain sensitivity. Um, You've answered part of part of the question I'm going to ask you now. Um, if you would look at the present, what are the challenges we're facing, or what are the trends that you see? Well, um, in order to establish new stuff, obviously <laughs> you have to be critical against the existing. Yeah, and this is uh, good, but also bad because. Uh, the whole movement of uh, agile frameworks, agility and so on, came uh, with a lot of criticism uh, regarding classical uh, traditional project management. And this is bad, uh, in my opinion, because um, I think we have to use the best of both worlds. Um, so when we talk about projects, um, you can not only manage a project uh, in an agile way. Uh, I only see hybrid uh, projects, uh, <laughs> which means if Sorry we have that. something which is a project and it has a certain complexity, then of course you have to, maybe using the terminology of uh, agile frameworks, you have to run different waves, uh, which are project phases and some of these waves can be done in an agile way, so you can apply Scrum or whatsoever, but you still need a project framework and you need uh, project roles like a project manager and so on. And it's not enough to have your Scrum masters. You can have those for your Scrum teams or development teams whatsoever. So I think um, there's the beautiful thing is that uh, new things pop up and uh, they need to be considered. Uh, there's learning chances and you need to integrate them in existing frameworks and contexts. And um, this is uh, where we stand uh, today, in my opinion, that there's agile frameworks like you mentioned MBO before, now we call it uh, OKR. Uh, yeah, fine. same thing in a different dress. <laughs> Correct, why not? It's uh, beautiful. Uh, it focuses on the communication process uh, much more. It's applied to uh, organization, organizational units and not to individuals uh, only. So it makes a lot of sense. And in my opinion, uh, appropriate project objectives planning, of course, is a major topic. And uh, if OKR can uh, support that, hey, uh, that's beautiful. And there's design thinking and there's prototyping and this thinking in smaller units uh, relates to this uh, chain of projects uh, concept I uh, mentioned uh, before very shortly that not the whole life cycle here is to be perceived as the project but maybe you do a prototype first and uh, then uh, only you go into a series uh, production development or whatever it is. Um, so I think there are new concepts that are very helpful but there's a need to integrate that appropriately in project management and there is a lot of uh, understanding required and um, there are methods, the methods are easy to teach and also to understand but the challenge is the mindset which is required for that because 
the mindset uh, within the own organization. Uh, if you structure the way of working differently, if you apply um, new decision making methods like prototyping uh, or uh, design thinking processes or whatever it is, uh, but also in the cooperation with your clients, uh, because that means that you have to have the same understanding on how you work, uh, what your responsibilities are. We for sure need integrative project organizations where you have representatives from your client organizations to take on responsibility for what's happening in the project. Because uh, if you are a delivering uh, organization, you need uh, the task to be performed by the client organizations, not only in terms of testing, but in terms of uh, defining uh, your user stories or whatever, setting priorities. So it's a whole new mindset of how collaboration actually works. And this is uh, very, very challenging uh, to be achieved. And uh, there is a lot still to be done. I guess the concepts are here. But to get it really understood and implemented in organizations, we are far away. Let me let me ask you some some short direct questions. When was your first introduction or exposure to Agile? Um, I guess it was some four or five years ago. So not, really, not too long ago. Yeah. Let but, me ask you a question. Yeah. Because I, I have a I have a standard statement, and I keep bringing it up in every podcast. It's I'm not sounding like a broken record already. I've been exposed formally to, to Agile over 10, maybe even 12 years. Mm -hmm. When you were first read the first concept of Agile, what was your internal reaction? Well, of course, uh, you pose it, right? And you think, uh, what is this? Was it How something it new to you? Yeah, definitely. Very, was it new? Yeah, yeah, very new. See, I had a different experience. The methods, the roles. Yeah, no, but I'm talking about the not the, the fundamentals. The mindset, the fundamentals. The fundamentals. Good, good project management always was agile, not in terms of Thank methods, you. but in terms of mindset. I, I would even say in, in if there are new yeah. requirements, then you better adjust to those. If you don't, you're not a good project manager. I, what is this? I would even Forget say that it. I would even say that a lot of the methods that are claimed to be agile have a history. I mean, if you're talking about iteration, okay, the the great great grandfather of iteration was the Deming cycle. I'm sorry, mm -hmm. okay. The the PMI. Uh, I don't know if, if IPMA did the same. I, I'm assuming, but IPMA and the PMI life cycle, which is a little bit different, mm -hmm. is also kind of an homage to mm -hmm. to the Deming cycle plan, do check mm -hmm. act. Then there was this spiral model. Then there was a rolling wave model. Um, SAP Activate uh, or SAP had had mm -hmm. in the last 20 years had iterative models. The stage gate or phase gate model is nothing else mm -hmm. than the release thing. So um, correct. My my personal impression of of, of agile think is I think it, they were absolutely legitimate. I like them. I like the fact that there were pioneers that banged on the table and said, you know what, enough of the the formalistic, you know, academic approach to project management that focuses just on on documentation and doesn't have honest conversations. I'm not saying that predictive project management was predestined to be that way, but mm -hmm. I think a lot of projects kind of shifted into that direction. Mm -hmm. And I think the new generation put their foot down and said, "This is this this needs to be different." You know, mm -hmm. we need to have. We shouldn't be talking to the sponsor only at the beginning of the project. And the sponsor, what does a sponsor know about the product? Nothing. Let's let's create somebody that's called a product oh, owner on, that yeah. takes over 50% of the responsibility of the sponsor when it comes to making decisions mm -hmm. and is and actually comes from a line organization that's actually going to work with this product when it's finished. Brilliant concept. Sure. Um, so the it, you have you have an interesting background. I'm going to use as a metaphor. You you have um, in your past been a professional f football player. Yeah, yeah. You you soccer for those. soccer for those who <laughs> don't know what football is. Not American football. You're yeah, yeah. uh, uh, not European world football. I uh, say this. Okay. Um, now the the analogy that I was I was use here uh, when when you played you I, I'm I'm assuming that you played with Rapid, right? Rapid and uh, <laughs> the classical lineup was goalie. Libero sweeper mm -hmm. and three three person defense, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, sure. Um, what is the the present day lineup? The present day lineup is I'm, I'm not even know if I'm up to date. It's <laughs> a goalie, four person defense. 
It varies. It there, varies. There might be three or There five. might also be two, three. Mm-hmm. Okay. The analogy that I'm using here is that I think that, that Agile, just like modern strategies of lineup, mm-hmm. give you new potential in dynamics and operational execution. But at the end of the day, you're still playing on a football field. Mm-hmm. There's still a goal. There's still essential roles that are, have not changed. The goalie. You still want to win. And the game is over after 90 yeah. minutes. Right? And, and, mm-hmm. and quite honestly, one team plays better with one lineup and another team mm-hmm. plays better with another lineup, whether it's Tiki Taki or whatever the different <laughs> strategies is. What I, what I love about Agile, I think Agile has, has, has re-energized the conversation about project management. I think that's good. I, 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 what I think where we, you and I would probably see eye to eye, what's a little bit annoying is this concept that it's a revolution. It's not a revolution, it's an evolution. Mm-hmm. And quite honestly, the first time I read a, an Agile book, I said, this is brilliant, but I've been doing this since I've been doing projects. Mm-hmm. For me, there was never, there was never a, a, during initiation and planning, I always use predictive methodologies, even if there's Agile predictive, right? Because mm-hmm. that's what management wants from you, mm-hmm. right? But there's, for me, there's no way to go into execution. Just like you said at the beginning of this podcast, you can be as predictive as you want. Reality, it's like Mike Tyson says, everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face, right? <laughs> if you're not using agile methodology when you're, when you're executing, you're doing something wrong. Whether you call it agile or not. But that's the difference. Yeah. You know, uh, I think you need to call it and then you can do it. If you don't call it like this, you behave uh, similarly, but... Uh, the HL approach as such uh, has a certain framework and uh, this, I guess, shall be and can be introduced in our project approaches. Uh, what's so important for me is, you know, this process way of thinking. Uh, I think there in German, uh, they are called Vorgehensmodelle. How yeah. would you call it? It's, uh, uh, procedures. Procedures, procedures is what we, or standard okay. operating procedures. Is okay, what yeah. okay. Uh, and for me, Agile, hybrid, uh, waterfall, these are um, operating procedures. Yes, they're tools in your toolbox. And those are not project management models uh, because project management remains project management. It's the full umbrella. Yeah, correct. And this difference is very important because very often people talk about agile project management. There's no agile project management. Project management is starting, is controlling, is closing. Uh, And that's always the same, but uh, to perform your content in a project, you might use agility as an operating uh, procedure, or you might use it as a, basically we are talking about requirement concepts, requirement planning, requirement management. There's the waterfall requirement uh, approach where you define everything at the very beginning. Especially when you have large budgets. Correct. Uh, And then uh, you have uh, agile requirement work with user stories and so on, where you reprioritize and redefine uh, new uh, user stories and so on to be fulfilled within a vision. And that's, again, important, you know, people say, okay, we work HL in project, which means they don't have a clear objective. And that's ridiculous. What, yeah. what do you mean? In German, so we say, we Projekt durch Wurstlung, which means yeah, yeah. Uh, we're just winging it. Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. No, no, this is uh, so the agility um, sometimes is not applied and used in an appropriate format. I, I, yeah, I, I think also, I, th- I think I agree with you. I, I, I think um, I think just like a- a- agile process has legitimate critique on, on how some people apply predictive. Correct. I think there's equal, equal constructive criticism that can be applied towards agile. And I think at the end of the day, this is my personal experience with clients. Clients will tell you what they need, and it's kind of based on their situation, on their culture, mm-hmm. right? Uh, I I don't know how often I have to have this conversation. So, so what's a product owner? Yeah. Uh, where's the project manager? You know, what a, mm-hmm. what a, what's my role? Yeah. Because ultimately, we're still playing football, mm-hmm. right? So we don't want to have a system that's so cumbersome that no, if you don't know how to play four four person defense then it's useless, right? So it's one thing to call it, but mm-hmm. uh, this, this one statement that also triggers me, this wonderful statement, it's more important to, to be agile than to do agile. Mm-hmm. Correct, that's the mindset issue. Uh, and I'm like, yeah, but you're not a marathon runner unless you run kilometers. <laughs> you're not a tennis player unless yeah, you yeah. play hours of tennis, right? Yeah. So you can't, you, I think a lot of people are, are, are doing this 
agile, agile, agile. And I'm like, yeah, but what are you doing? Hmm. You know, you have you have the big runner watch, you have a nice pair of running shoes, but are you running? Hmm. Do you know how to do it? Does your team know how to apply it? Let's let's move on to to stage three. Um, Let me get go ahead. Sure. One more top uh, topic uh, as far as HL is concerned. Um, I think the benefit really is um, the focus on the communication, and uh, you have all these. Also, the dynamic mindset. Yeah, the to not be so format. so stuck in the mud. Correct. In terms of resetting your yeah. priorities and whatsoever. Um, so you have these retrospectives, for example, mm -hmm. in your HL approaches in Scrum. Uh, but as you say, if you are a good project manager in the past, of course you reflect in a project team meeting when you do your project controlling. You don't look at the hard facts, but that has a lot to do with the understanding of what project management is all about. So you need to look at the organization, you need to look at the stakeholder relations, you need to reflect on that. And this is where do we stand, what's going well, what's going bad, what can we do differently in the future, and so on. So hey, retrospectives is part of project controlling, of course. And yeah, it uh, makes that for common be, sense. Correct. Communication uh, in projects, people say, okay, we can use uh, artificial intelligence, for example, to develop project resource plans or develop project plans as such. This is ridiculous, right? Uh, it might support, we might talk about this uh, in a minute, but basically, um, you need to develop a common project picture in the heads of the project team members, in the heads of the uh, steering committees uh, and so on. And for this, you need communication structures. You need to work with post-its and so on to uh, s develop a project culture in so far as you develop a common project language. Uh, we, you, Our perspective, my perspective of what project plans are for they are supporting the project communication. If you develop a work breakdown structure, then you create a common view in the project team of what has to be done, how we name the different work packages that we need to do. So uh, this is the process here is even more important than the result of this project plan because you develop this common picture, you develop a common language, you uh, create a basis for uh, the project work. So what I'm trying to say is the project plans don't have a meaning in itself. Uh, they support the communication in the projects and this is what they're for. And this is picked up somehow by these agile approaches that they focus quite a bit on this uh, team communication and so on. I think that if you, if you leave the methodology or the scrum methodology by side, I think the greatest greatest ingredient, the greatest value that the Agile conversation has brought to modern project management is that they address the crucial issue. In traditional project management, we kind of had this, this mentality, you know, we need to get the, the okay from the sponsor, from the king, mm -hmm. but we don't want to bother the king. So we focus everything in initiation and planning. We keep the communication cycles short. We get the approval and he says, okay, here's your charter and then go and leave me alone. Mm -hmm. And Agile says, the, the problem with initiation and planning is that you, depending on the complexity of your project, there's only so much you can nail down. Mm -hmm. There's always going to be a gap of what you know, the unknown unknown as we call it, right? So Agile says, you know, it, it makes, first of all, often we spend way too much time in planning, number one. Uh, and we're planning things that there's no way we can know. No, too and this, far away. Yeah. <clears throat> and, and the other thing is, wouldn't just it make sense to to get the not look as their sponsor as a king? He or she should get off their horse and they should do management by walking around in an age old concept. Mm -hmm. And you know what? We'll have short, sweet meetings, retrospectives, we'll have reviews, Stand right? Up, and we'll talk to one another as, as human beings, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and not create these, these artificial hierarchical barriers which don't contribute to conversation. I just this week had was involved in, in a project management meeting for, for a, non, uh, a nonprofit organization that was trying to create uh, get funding from the European Union. And they had a wonderful documentation, had a great plan and great detail. Uh, and I was smiling because it's it, it's kind of like you if you've been in project management, you know that this happened. No matter how how great your your project plan is in the beginning, when people start looking at it and start understanding it, right? 
Um, we have this wonderful saying, uh, uh, you know, that, you know, it, it, thought is not said, said is not heard, heard is not understood, and understood is not agreed upon. Not done. All right? And then you have the done part. <laughs> yeah. um, what, they said this wonderful plan, and they thought all they're going to do is a present, it's going to be a kickoff, and all of a sudden people were raising hands what and going this? into yeah. levels of detail that were way beyond the plan. Mm -hmm. And and that's kind of the reason why Agile says, you know what, the conversation is not done with a kickoff. The conversation about scope, time, and cost is not done yeah. uh, once we have assigned uh, approval for a project. There, there are legitimate things. Uh, and, and you mentioned... Uh, it's uh, ongoing. You, you, one of the things you mentioned, I, I think one of the, the biggest weaknesses we had in the past and still have today to a certain extent is the roles of steering committees. Are, are they passive? Are they report to me and I'll listen? Mm -hmm. Or are they actively asking questions? Are, are they are they a asking? Are, are they taking a mentorship role? Mm. Okay. Are they are they in removing impediments? Right. Uh, are, are you know are they asking how can we better integrate the project into into our day to day operations? These kind of questions are are mm -hmm. essential, uh, and I think I think they're they're partly lacking. My point of view on steering committees is they are too large. There are too many sitting in there. I mean, sometimes the wrong people. Six, seven, eight people, even more in large programs uh, and so on. So I see steering committees of at most three people. Really? Yeah. Okay. The others, uh, we need to have stakeholder communications and they need to be involved. But uh, we need to reduce uh, the number of uh, steering committee members in order to make sure that these people are really responsible because if the group is too large, they do get anonymous. You know, they they can hide they behind can, they hide. behind the group. Correct. Yeah. yeah, and they just sit in there to be informed and to take care of their uh, functional interests. There's this HR guy and there's the accounting guy or whatsoever. So they have their specific interest and they take care of this, but they don't have the self understanding that when they are project sponsors, steering committees, or whatsoever they are responsible for the results of the project overall and not only that their specific uh, functional field is uh, appropriately represented um, and this self-understanding um, is definitely missing and uh, i work with a few organizations which explicitly have a community of practice of uh, project sponsors or project owners or steering committee members whatever. So they work on their self-understanding, they make them familiar with the project management approaches because they need to be capable to read the project plans and to give feedback to this and to understand, you they know. They need to understand the process. They need to understand mm -hmm. it and they That's my biggest need issue. to challenge the project management to a certain degree because project managers lie. Well, sorry, sorry. No, I, I, I can accept lie. that. I think, but I, I think that's almost a given. I think that's kind of a kabuki theater that we play in 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 project. We're mm -hmm. often forced to accept unrealistic scope, time, and cost. So, what other option do we have as to lie? <laughs> yeah, yeah. This is where the problem starts. Yeah, yeah. Taking over uh, a project, uh, of course, uh, you have the responsibility, and you should have the right to challenge. Uh, the frame uh, in terms of the budget, uh, the scope of work uh, to be done. Uh, of course, there were different people that did this conceptual work and these uh, initial project planning and whatsoever. But uh, when you start off the project and you work with a real project team, you involve uh, the project team members, which are not really the experts and can tell you mm. what to be done and so on. So there needs to be a redefinition of the project charter uh, in the starting process. Yeah. 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 Well, I mean, that's where Agile comes up with this. This is also kind of what I call a Trojan horse by, by mm. Agile, the concept of minimum mm. viable product, right? Mm. Which they kind of snuck in there and everybody thinks it's a mm. cute name. It is highly subversive. Mm. It, it basically addresses the fact, listen, you're, you're giving me unrealistic scope. Mm. And what I'm doing <laughs> is just like, you know, when you go to your sponsor, say, I mm. want 100,000, he goes, I'll give you 80. Mm. What minimum viable product is, is exactly when the, when the sponsor says, I want 100% quality, you say, 
I'll give you 80. Right? Mm-hmm. It's this trade-off factor. I mean, we we it constantly revolves around this That's this right. triple constraint. That's funny, yeah. yeah. So I, I find it interesting what you say about, about steering committee. I don't know if I, I would necessarily agree. Mm-hmm. I think I would agree. I, I think what you're talking about, and I think this is also semantics that that that's something we have to develop in the future, um, is the understanding that there's different formats of different structural elements. For example, a steering committee. What what you're talking about, I would call more the 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 guiding steering committee or the operational steering committee. Those three people mm-hmm. that want to be involved that are kind of very aligned with the product owner or the project manager. I still think for political reasons um, and for for integrations reasons that you you would probably not as often as meeting with the operational uh, steering committee. I would also have a a kind of functional steering committee that you know once a month, once every two months, once a quarter mm-hmm. is informed, uh, so that they they take note. Hey, you've been informed. Um, but and they then, don't steer. Yeah, they, therefore I wouldn't yeah. call them steering committee. Maybe maybe in we German need it's may, or, yeah yeah you know, maybe we need to change. It's a way of uh, marketing. Yeah, you know? we need to change it's the name. And and then what often <clears throat> happens with very large organizations is that you might also have uh, uh, because you know we always talk about the project sponsor. How often is the project sponsor really the most politically strong individual in the or, in the organization? Sometimes it's just a representative of God on earth, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Um, if it's a large organization, you have a board that's giving you a lot of money. They want to be informed as well. Mm-hmm. Not as often as the Bayrat. Yeah. Uh, so you have the the what I call the executive committee yeah, yeah. Uh, that gets informed. I don't know every four months, right? It's not a project role to me, you know. The project role, I want to have those people that take on project responsibility in the project itself and perform certain tasks. But of course, you have to inform the project, uh, the yeah. uh, uh, executive committee yeah. uh, or whatsoever, yeah. your board of yeah. directors. But you don't want the board of directors as a project sponsor. Forget about it because you never get yeah. this management attention yeah. that you need as project manager. Yeah. They never talk to you. Yeah. They invite you, but they are not there. Yeah. So that's ridiculous. Yeah. This is harming everything this is not helpful yeah i still this is a feedback i can give you from from that statement i, I still mm-hmm. i think it's great that after so many years of project management you still have a pragmatic operational mm-hmm. uh, approach to it you're kind of so let's let's leave the <laughs> let's leave the frills away let's focus on what works that's that's great i meet these situations anyhow <laughs> in reality but uh, i have to have my point of view no this is and that's what we invited yeah, you for yeah. uh l- let me let's go on to the to the third topic i i was i recently got a, a feedback uh, on something i posted on linkedin it was a very nice gentleman from from germany uh, that congratulated on me on, on a podcast and and basically asked the open question what do i think are the trends of today slash future and I thought it was a, a, a great question. What do you what do you see? Where where's project management going? What do you what do you think that's gonna what's the world of project management gonna look like in 10, 15, 20 years? Well basically they're gonna be projects, uh, that's for sure. And um, yeah, all kinds of different projects. Um, there will be different ways of managing those, uh, of course. Uh, but I think what's important is you cannot do project management if you don't understand and optimize and have clarity about the processes which are to be performed. So in we're the coming project. back to the old co- common language, common process. Yeah, but uh, I'm talking about content related pro- yeah. uh, processes. So if you are an engineering company, and you have good project management applied, but if you don't have clarity about your uh, detailed design or your procurement or your commissioning or whatsoever, these processes are not clear, are not in place, then you will never be successful in your project. So what I'm trying to say is uh, we need governance structures which are integrated. And we we were talking about a one uh, management approach uh, where you have common basic values if you want your principles of uh, agile or whatever values uh, they might be uh, that apply to project management that apply to process management that apply to change management so uh, the way on how you communicate how much empowerment you give uh, how you integrate with your 
uh, suppliers and your customers and so on. These are basic values that apply to all of these uh, processes. And you mentioned PMO before, and therefore uh, sometimes companies uh, talk about a management office, uh, which integrates or looks at the integration of uh, these functions, which does make sense, um, of course. Uh, so what I'm saying is there will be projects, but you need to be professional in the project, not only by managing them, but also to have good quality in the content related uh, processes. So a balanced overall management approach and an integrated view on those, uh, I think um, definitely are required and would be helpful. Um, in terms of I, I like that friends. you went right for right for the gusto. My my response was I I kind of tried to appeal I guess to the modern modern sentiment because if I think you put a microphone in a lot of people's faces, the first thing they would say is AI. Okay, yeah. AI, 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 AI. I yeah, think yeah. AI has some validity. I think we're not anywhere close to understanding what validity we'll have for project management, but but we're, we're developing that. The other thing was industrialization 5.0, the the mm -hmm. whole dynamics. If you're if you're working on projects, if you're building factories or restructuring your infrastructure, these are are, are things that will have implemental impact. I think another future topic is the concept of of uh, working with working with dislocated or virtual teams. I think we've come a long way, but I think there's going to be a huge step forward because it's kind of hard to live the agile mm -hmm. philosophy dislocated. Yeah. I think that's the biggest challenge, and I think we're going to overcome some of that. Mm -hmm. um, I think the development of, of, of here and there, new strategies in, in hybrid application, um, I think the concept of rapid problem solving and decision making, whether that be over VUCA or whatever else, I think that's some, some of the, the, the future trends. Um, that's, I think, what most people want to hear from you. Yeah. My real answer is the problems of the, 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 the essential fundamental issues of humanity have been the same for the last 10,000 years. Hmm. Oh. And the solutions have been the same for the last 10,000 years, maybe in different formats, maybe better, less better formats, different versions of applying the game. And I think that's not going to change in the future. I absolutely agree with you. Project management is here to stay. And, and if somebody were to really ask me what the future of project management is, I think they would be shocked on how simplistic and archaic and maybe old fashioned my response would be. I wish we would stop talking about it and I wish we would do it more. I don't believe that the state of understanding, I don't think most organizations really embrace projects as they should. I don't think they maximize their potential. I think the concept of programs is prevalent, but is still very sophomoric, very junior in its conceptual application mm -hmm. and integration between the project landscape and the, and the line organization. And I think what all of you out there should be ashamed of, uh, most of you should be ashamed of, is that you use the word portfolio management and you don't, in, in any form or fashion, most companies, I mean, there's some exceptions to the rule, really live its potential. And I think it's, it's something that I have no qualms telling any board member. I mean, if I go to a board member and I ask you how many projects do you have in your portfolio and you don't Nobody know how to knows. answer it. Nobody knows. You, 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 that's, as we say in German, you're not, you're mm -hmm. not doing, you're not fulfilling your role. <clears throat> and I don't even mean that to, as a blame game. I just, you're just losing out on so much potential. Do you know how many projects? What is your, your, your budget for projects? How do you distribute your project? How are you mentoring and from an executive or senior management perspective, supporting the operational and strategic or tactical implementation of projects on the ground. You have a responsibility. We have a pyramid for a reason. Uh, there's different levels and those hierarchies have a vertical distribution of responsibility. And I don't think, I see very few executives that truly understand how valuable project portfolios are to them. Um, I don't. I don't think they have sufficient KPIs. I think. I think the future of project uh, project management, hopefully, is project portfolio sensible application of project portfolio management. It becomes a little bit more second nature. I mean, I had one of my first podcasts uh, was Wolfgang Gashka from from Siemens. I think Siemens is a good example 
I mean, not everything in Siemens is is plated in in gold or you know 100% gold, but they they have a at least on a higher level have a conceptual understanding that if you're a board member, you have you have portfolio exp- uh, 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 responsibility, and that's financial portfolio, product mm-hmm. portfolio, and project portfolio. For me, project portfolio management is a strategic management function, and this needs to be understood. Yeah. But it's not, and. Um, yeah, that's all that I can say to this uh, topic. Um, but maybe I can come back to the artificial intelligence uh, issue because I think, um, I mean, I agree totally that um, there is so much good uh, available in terms of project management approaches and so on. Uh, which is still not applied appropriately and, of course, needs to be adapted here or there. But uh, we are talking about back uh, to uh, the roots and uh, a few things to do really um, professionally and consciously uh, and so on and get the benefits uh, out of this. So this is definitely um, a strategy that I would recommend. But uh, new concepts like artificial intelligence uh, need to be considered. Uh, and I think those are pretty interesting. Uh, tell you the truth, I'm not too familiar with um, much of that already, but I get involved uh, in this uh, in these days. And what's important for me here is uh, to clearly differentiate between application of uh, artificial intelligence for the content side of the projects and for project management, because again, I see that this is mixed up. Content side, uh, just to give you one example, coming back to construction, there is uh, BIM, um, um, construction uh, information modeling uh, systems. Uh, Of course, uh, those are pretty smart and pretty far developed based on CAD and so on. Um, So, and uh, for marketing uh, applications and whatsoever, uh, artificial intelligence content-wise can be applied in projects. And the second question is, can it be applied for project management too? And what I read so far is that uh, the recommendations are to apply it for project planning, for scheduling, for resource uh, management, again, for these quantitative approaches. But this cuts short, in my opinion, because Uh, Also, how to organize, how to manage stakeholders uh, definitely are issues in project management and you cannot focus here again on these quantitative uh, topics. Uh, So the question is, which parameters do you need uh, to inform your uh, artificial intelligence system? Uh, So what is required? Which kind of data so that we can get appropriate uh, feedback here or support for uh, managing the project in your project teams, in your project organization. So given that the communication is so important and that the knowledge uh, of different experts is combined in projects and so on, so this is a very uh, complex uh, process. And of course, it can be supported uh, to certain degrees. And uh, I've seen that's definitely 20 years ago, uh, I worked for Unisys and they already had some parameters for their contracting projects uh, which helped them for certain technologies to develop initial project plans, you know, Mm. and those of course had to be um, uh, adapted and further developed or whatsoever. But uh, this is 20 years ago, so again, it's not uh, so new, the whole concept. But uh, Well, the solution concept though is still a framework that can be applied today. Yeah. 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 And uh, I've seen a paper, which is funny, where they use uh, artificial intelligence, for example, to uh, design retrospectives uh, in projects. Uh, Well, why not? They get, uh, you know, some ideas uh, because you need to vary there because otherwise uh, you do remember. But AI is not going to replace the need for individual consciousness, decision making, problem awareness. It it should be a tool to accelerate. To support. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Actually, there's 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 one more old and one more new topic that I see on on the horizon for the future. One that's old. I still think 
There's a lot of companies that are questioning the validity and the value of PMOs. I don't question it whatsoever. I think we just no. need to redesign it. Yeah. So that's the old. But there is something new that I, I think it, there, that can create value for, for the PMO initiative. And that is, we often see organizations as a matrix organization, line organization, project organization. We often forget that it's not a two-dimensional. It's often a three, sometimes four or five-dimensional. Um, Three-dimensional for me would be the element of change. Uh, you've already mentioned you know, the discovery and evaluation process that SAP has. Um, one of the things that I think creates an incredibly valuable addition to the project mm. management understanding is the more holistic and long-term understanding of how we navigate projects within an organization. And that is the link, the strong link between change initiatives be it, be it Six Sigma, Lean, Lean is a mm. big topic. Mm. I think there's a huge, I think they're twin, I think change and project management are twin sisters uh, or brothers. Um, and, and you wrote a book about change, so I would ask you, would you, would you agree, mm. what's your perspective? What, how, how is somebody who's an icon of project management mm. also a big uh, proponent of the change? Where do you see the link? Yeah, well, there's several things. Um, one thing I would like, uh, to start off with, uh, first of all, is how things are changing in my perspective, in my purpose of working and uh, my role in the uh, society here, uh, community, is that for several years, the purpose that I represented was happy projects. Yeah. Uh, and One of your best books, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But um, the original idea was if you perform your projects uh, professionally with good project management, then you create happy projects, happy sponsors, happy stakeholders, happy team members, yeah. you know, they get, um, they are taken seriously, uh, there is social responsibility you have versus your project team members and so on. So there's something like uh, happy projects based on professional project management. So this is what I lived with, I don't know, for 20, 30 years. Um, in the last 10 years, I was focusing a bit on the topic uh, of sustainability. And it was became clear that the project itself doesn't have any value. The project it's is a means to an end. Correct. Yeah. It's contributing to something. Something uh, bigger. So we redefined, and this is this learning in this adaptation that I'm thinking is required uh, and also to project management uh, that now our purpose is formulated as happy project for a sustainable business value. So I love, what do you yeah. need the happy projects for? Well, there is it's a, a means to an end. Yeah. And this is the business value. And the business value is economic, is social, is ecologic. And this is the strategic issue. And this is where the change issue comes in. Because you do your project oh, wow. in order to achieve something. And uh, so you change something. Uh, so every project is contributing to a change. Every project. If you do a contracting project, then you change something in your client organization. If you have your internal projects, your product development, your reorganization, your marketing, you change something in your organization and you are better aware of this in terms of deciding that you actually do this project, that you have the strengths, the capabilities, the competences to do it because you want to achieve something for your organization. Uh, and second, that the project organization, the members of the project organizations, the sponsor, the project manager, the team members, uh, are aware that they in the project are contributing to a change. People don't like change, okay? So there is uh, working against it. Uh, so you need to understand this uh, situation in order to manage it appropriately. So you need to communicate. You need to communicate the benefit of the project for your company only then uh, the users of the solution and so on will accept this. So I guess change management has a big relevance for the single project because you as a project manager, you have the responsibility to make the change and the benefits of the change visible to the rest of the organization. And this is not understood at all. Yes. The project manager understands 
I have this budget, I have this scope of work, these are my objectives, I have to fulfill it if this is true then uh, I'm successful. Well, yeah, no. it's kind of, a, I have an operational yeah. scope and the Correct. product. I think the biggest, biggest. This is yeah. too short. I think, you know, I think we kind of screwed ourselves in the in the project management community because mm. one of the, the, the defining characteristics of, of a project, uh, mm. according to IPMA and as a PMI, is that projects are temporary, right? Yeah. Projects are temporary, but the initiative, an investment behind the it. backbone yeah. behind it is not yeah. temporary. Correct. I mean, we're, we're handicapping ourselves. Mm -hmm. You know, if, you're, if you have an internal project, your return of investment is not in the life cycle, right? Mm -hmm. So, and, and I, I'm struggling with this, with, with this vocabulary right now. OKR for me is very unclean vocabulary, okay? Mm -hmm. What I find much more cleaner than I know from the UNIDO is the concept of projects have outputs. I think most project management love outputs. Mm -hmm. And we're and shocked that nobody else cares yeah. about our outputs. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Because most people don't care about the outputs, they want the outcome. Yeah. Correct. That's and what, a business value. And what yeah. you're talking about, yeah. which is much higher level, and I think this is the future, <laughs> I hope this is the no. future of project management, is the understanding of this, of what we call triple bottom line. There's a there's a, a, a financial benefit, there's a strategic benefit, but there's hopefully also a societal benefit, mm -hmm. which is the third level, it, there's output, outcome, impact. Mm -hmm. And I think everybody's is emotionally um, in love with the concept of impact. I think most people don't have a clean definition of it, but I think this concept of of because a PMI a, a, is kind of focusing very strong on the value of a PMO is to sometimes they always call it a, a, a VDO, a value delivery office instead mm -hmm. of a PMO, whatever mm -hmm. makes you happy. Mm -hmm. um, or operational excellence or business excellence is other words that we use for it. I, I think I think a, a PMI is is pushing the concept that we don't just cost money, but that we create value. But the mm -hmm. only way to create awareness of that value mm -hmm. is to not just look at your projects in increments, beginning and end, but to see what happens afterwards. And the only way to to manage that gray area is to have a strong, well established project organization within within uh, within the organization. I want to maybe as one of our last topics um, that's not so much about future. I think this is something that's prevalent and has been prevalent in, in project management. And I have my own thoughts, my own historical justification for why this is. Uh, and I've been playing with this with this conversation, with this hot topic, with a number of different people from different industries. But I'd like to get your take on it. Um, we talked about how how sometimes disappointed we are about how well the overall project management philosophy and governance model is integrated into the organization. That, that senior executives uh, are still somewhat resistant to discussing the topic. Why do you think that is? And you can be undiplomatic if you like. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I guess I come with a solution right away, maybe, uh, that I think that the success of the project, however it's measured, needs to be a part of the MBO system in organizations, which means uh, the line managers uh, have a basically measured uh, against the line results, whatever they are, uh, and not against the project results. Um, and therefore, coming back to the number of steering committee members, we want to have few steering committee members so the steering committee members can also be made responsible for the project success. So for projects, uh, maybe one uh, project sponsor or steering committee member, uh, project owner, however you call it, would be enough which means they would have the understanding that for this project I'm responsible and I'm measured against and uh, I accept that I empower one of my colleagues for another project to take on the responsibility there. But we need to make the managers responsible, not the project managers only, but uh, the line managers and the board members responsible for projects and programs of the organization because they are of strategic value. They um, contribute to the sustainability of uh, the organization. So, hey, why wouldn't they take care of this uh, projects and programs? 
So I guess this is the solution. And therefore, where is the problem? They are not made responsible. There is no direct the, relationship the to the of, projects. The, I, I, maybe I'll, I'll add to that. I think if you look mm-hmm. at the RACI model, right? Yeah. Um, one of the things that, that executives love, if they have a difficult thing, they love to delegate, which is their, yeah. their prerogative. Yeah. And when they delegate, if I delegate to you or vice versa, you become responsible. But a lot of people don't understand, I can't make you responsible without being accountable. Mm. The concept of an accountable executive, that's actually a term mm. that's used in some, it's a beautiful concept, but I don't think it's understood or lived often, like. right? So I, I can't pass the buck on to you without still being involved, which is the agile concept, mm. right? Mm. Um, I, I did a, a small uh, video, uh, I call it Heaven and Hell, where I, I introduced funny little concepts. And one of the mm. things we did was something called the whipping boy. The Prügelknabe, the concept, mm-hmm. which goes back, it's a historical concept that, mm-hmm. um, that, for example, and the principle behind the whipping boy was when a prince had got their education as a boy and they misbehaved in school with their tutor, you couldn't punish the prince. <laughs> so, but the concept of punishment was part of society. Somebody had to be held accountable. So what they would do is they would pay some servant so they could whip his. Good, and, I and, love it. And 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 I think <laughs> I think that I don't think it's done consciously, but I think subconsciously executives use the hand puppet mentality of projects. Mm-hmm. So you're the project manager. Mm-hmm. I'm going to make you feel good. I'm going to I'm going to delegate it to you. You you can't decide anything. Yeah. Okay. It's like the hand puppet. The hand, yeah. pu- the puppet doesn't talk. It doesn't move. It's the hand that's moving. Yeah. But if the puppet does something that's wrong, you take the puppet off and they throw it on the ground and say, "Bad puppet, bad puppet." I think that is something that's still kind of in our DNA, and I think we need to get it out. I think there's two other reasons why there's still a certain hesitation from, or three, uh, from. Exec- I think number one, to be fair to them, I just I don't think they really understand it. I agree. Which means, you know, we are so often uh, asked to develop uh, uh, some offerings for trainings and so on. And they always talk about the project managers. And I say, well, fine, good, train your project managers. But what about your project owners or sponsors? We, we don't. We know. We understand it. We are HR. No, no. We are HR. We cannot touch them. And you know that's yeah. too tricky. And the second question is, what about the project team members? You know how far they don't need the comprehensive training a project manager requires, uh, but they, they need, need to, to know understand the, the, the process, the language, the, the milestones. The, yeah. The the basic framework yeah, of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree with you. And their roles in the project yeah. and that when there is a project team meeting and something is going wrong, they need to speak up. Yeah. So I, I think the uh, the other reason besides behind not knowing what it is and not knowing whether it's relevant, maybe it's too operational, is is, is the is the mentality, I don't need to know that, or that's below me, somebody mm-hmm. else is taking care of it. I think that's still a mentality that's, that's very, very dominant, which I think is detrimental. And I think- It one takes of, time. Yeah. And if you're a project owner or a steering committee member, I would say half a day every two weeks are required. Yeah. It depends on in which phase we are, how complex the project is, and so on. But yeah, I agree with you. And and I think I think one of the and, and you know we always say that we have we have different things that you mentioned that the number one problem with change is that change, the automatic reaction to change is resistance. Correct. It's in the DNA of human beings yeah. that we we prefer, even if our situation is crappy, we prefer the crappy situ- the known crappy situation to the unknown better situation because mm-hmm. it just gives us anxiety. It's part. And I think there's a, a hidden subconscious psychology also in, in projects, um, and that is fear. I think there's, there's the... I think the lion organization, which is where the power is at home, Mm. the Machiavellian power of an organization, Mm. which is necessary. I think they're highly suspicious of the integrative function of project management and where we put our fingers into. I'll give you an example. I I, I did a a podcast with a Navy SEAL and with a a U.S. Army officer last year where I I discussed the the similarity Mm -hmm. between military organizations and Mm -hmm. line organizations because we come from that. Mm -hmm. That's where we borrowed it from. And in the military, there's there's a beautiful analogy that compares line organization with project, with the matrix organization. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, a military is dominant through size, numbers, process, orders, command, obey. Okay? Very strict rules. Mm -hmm. But there is no modern military that in certain contexts, in special contexts, hostage situations, uh, highly difficult, volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous situations, you're not going to send out a whole, com a whole company or a whole battalion because that could be detrimental. You could, it could have mm -hmm. a serious uh, implications. So what military has learned to augment their operational capacity with and capabilities with is special forces, mm -hmm. okay? For me, special forces are the best analogy of what project teams oh, are. Sure. What you mentioned at the beginning <clears throat> of the podcast, this concept of focus, highly trained, highly motivated, totally mm -hmm. interdisciplinary, completely agile in their mentality. They know the rules, they know when to bend them, mm -hmm. right? And, and, and they're focused on getting things done and not fulfilling a, some stupid process, mm -hmm. okay? I think, because I've, I've, I've noticed this also when you talk to, to officers, officers like special forces in the moment, but they find them suspect permanently because they have a rogue element to them. Mm -hmm. they, they disrupt the force, to use Star Wars language. They disrupt the, 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 the halls of power. I think, for example, functional leads, line organizations, feel that project managers interfere in their, in their scope of decision making. They interfere with their, with their processes, they interfere with their hardware, they interfere mm -hmm. with their resources. And I think there's a certain, certain hesitancy to, to not want to give project management more power than you absolutely need to. And I think that's why, I think the temporary nature of projects is partly not just attributed because it makes sense, mm -hmm. But I think it's also a, a way for the line organization to curb the potential influence that project managers would have on an organization. So you need to show them the benefits of giving it away um, because they might be project managers next time for themselves. And um, so, again, it's a mindset question. And yes, there is resistance and therefore you need to make this understandable and explain it uh, to the people, yeah. uh, for sure, yeah. yeah. Roland, great talking to you. There, there's one one more topic I, I, I want to address, or two more topics I want to address, is one, what, what you still have planned for this year, because there's some nice information that you'd like to share with the group. And uh, one thing we always like to do towards the end of our podcast is kind of talk about uh, what books you would recommend. In your case, that's pretty easy, because you've got a bunch. So yeah. maybe we should start with them. Uh, you want You want to give us a... What, yeah, your, your latest book? I'm happy to. Um, I mean, you mentioned the Happy Projects book. Uh, That's one of your staples. For, yeah, but um, this cannot be bought anymore. This is just uh, history also. And, uh, you know, I was at one of these IPMA World Congresses and uh, myself and a colleague of mine, we had the book with us and there was uh, some Asian guy, very nice and friendly, and he was reading. <laughs> this uh, title, Happy Project, and it was just, you know, going like this, uh, didn't understand it, didn't uh, really s uh, get the idea of what a Happy Project uh, might be. So that was a funny experience. So, yeah, it uh, really was a good title for many years. Uh, but then, of course, uh, project management is evolving. There are relationships uh, from projects to programs and to changes. So a uh, couple of years ago, we published, my son and myself, the book Project Program and Changes. It's uh, available in German and in English language. So yeah, this is, if somebody's interested, something I can recommend. And here we focus on the HL concepts and the integration of change and change management uh, to projects. The second thing I would like uh, to mention, and hopefully there's some interest, and if you might know that we organize every year uh, the so-called Happy Projects Conference. And uh, until three years ago, we did it uh, on site um, with some 300 uh, participants here in Austria. It was great time every year, you know, to find a new interesting topic and to further develop uh, the concepts uh, for this specific event. and. Uh, I really love to, to do this, 
But given the uh, Corona pandemic and so on, uh, we changed the format to an online format and we do it now uh, happy projects all year long. So we have three events starting in April uh, next year again. And um, next year is actually this year. Yeah. We are in yeah, 2024 exciting. already. Okay. And it's on the topic and this relates to what we discussed today yeah. quite a bit. Uh, the title is uh, Back to the Project Future. So again, the message there is that we need to appreciate some of the existing uh, topics and approaches and focus on those, but integrate new concepts. New what, Be open the to the new, but yeah. embrace the yeah. old as well. Yeah. That's for what it's worth. Very, very good. What well, make sure is. to put a link for the for the literature and and also for the events into the podcast, so that when we send it out, you'll have access to that. Yeah, Roland. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. And we talked about it. If you do an interview, uh, the interview should know more about himself uh, than before the interview. And uh, that definitely happened to me today. So thanks for I some insights. It. it was yeah. great having you on board and I look forward to staying in touch with you.